Hello everyone, today we talk about Louis XIV's contribution to the art of war, the development of the European armies and military thinking in general, which is not per se much of a scoped topic, at least the Sun King is remembered for his uh, magnificence, his, first of all his political style, also military of course, accomplishments, but mostly in a kind of a manualistic sense, right? We all know who he was. It's one of those few figures that in history I think everybody knows about. And yet we just focus on the, the splendid art that we can still, of course, appreciate in Versailles and in many other masterpieces. In fact, inspired to, to his own personal style. But even as far as the connection between Louis XIV's politics, um, also of course the French uh, spirit and history and mystics, metaphysics almost, that we have often commented on in the videos from, in fact, the Merovingians to the Capetians, have an enormous um, meaning in the traditional connection between sacred right and command the Imperium. And if you look at the Apollonian Uranian uh, symbolism of Louis XIV's art, embodied literally in fact by the solar uh, fabric sim symbology, you realize that uh, not only everything was kind of drawn from, of course, now uh, uh, in the Grand Siècle, a fully appreciated um, mythological, historical reconstruction of ancient symbolism, but literally the universal meaning that the most powerful ruler in Europe through the affirmation of his military. And this aspect is particularly fascinating because Louis XIV uh, died in the same century of the French Revolution, after all, and the hegemonic policy of France um, in Europe brought to, uh, in fact, a, a dramatic uh, leap forward in the process of state making, in fact, in modernization, the enlargement of armies, and I in a way setting the ground for those enormous um, breaks that would occur paradoxically exactly with, uh, with the traditional um, values, not much with absolute monarchy, which is a term that actually is, is wrong conceptually, but practically never existed, right? It's paradoxically the contemporary nation-state that creates an absolute power, uh, making of the state the sole source of law from the Code Napoleon onward, um, and that um, in fact embodies uh, the, the progress disgregation, let's say decay, corruption of the older imperial universal system. You can argue that France already in this in fact post um, universal war, or at least uh, Louis, as you know, came to power uh, in 1648, so the same year, the end of the Thirty Years' War, the creation of an allegedly Westphalian order, um, and essentially so even the, the, the same battlefields of Europe changing from the, the pike and shot to, to linear uh, tactics. Uh, I mean, we are appreciating a sovereign that, in w starting from the same France as a national reality, was pushing for claiming what were essentially universal imperial um, objectives that he wouldn't reach. But you know, considering, of course, the um, the potential of any power at the time, that's definitely the, the closest that uh, arrived to it. And, and so, I will not, of course digress on how this can be interpreted in, in the in a millinery perspective and of course in this gradual um, effort towards the, the creation of more universal more global powers that however kept failing in a sense ever since um, antiquity right so in, in a way that doesn't render justice in fact to the enormity of the accomplishment of sunking, but from a perspective that is mostly our own, right, and that has been often stripped of, of that kind, however, of, of truly traditional background. 
we think properly of France, but we don't ask ourselves of what, what France meant, especially in that monarchic frame set and in Louis' uh, beliefs, right? And I never made actually videos about Louis the Fourteenth, if not, I think one some years ago about the Dragonnade. So we will talk about them. Also speaking of Louvois. Um, but it, it's a chapter of European history that uh, deserves much greater consideration than it was what, what is usually done. I mean, it was just checking the the English Wikipedia about this this main, uh, say, key figures in, in in French politics from the same Louis to to, to Mazarino to the various um, French generals of the time to Louvois to Colbert. And so on, and and I realized that the space dedicated to them is is dramatically scarce. I mean, considering the amount of historiography existing on these figures and the obvious importance that um, they had, um, I think there is mostly an external uh, appreciation of certain figures. For example, Turenne is uh, rightfully appreciated as one of the greatest commanders in modern history. But even when we look at other great ones um, in, in the same age, you, you realize that, that there is a disproportion, even less than him, but there is still a disproportionate um, lesser attention uh, towards them. And probably there is not a culture or popular awareness on, in fact, on the scale of European politics. And there is hardly um, any figure, naturally, he. In, in his own time that incarnates the hardcore European traditional identity like Louis XIV. Mm -hmm. Thus, today I will just mostly address the, the gigantic effort that the Sun King made to literally make France an hegemon the hegemonic power uh, in Europe and what this meant from, from a strictly military point of view. But as always, the root uh, of, of, of these accomplishments is political and must be understood, not just, again, in the same effort, but in the mechanisms that lay behind that, which are often underappreciated. War, as we've seen, is central um, in the same space as a political act, Clausewitzinly speaking, and while Louis, personally, was not a great commander at all, Right, he didn't have any practice or capacity or interest in any particular way. He had an incredible uh, vision as far as, in fact, the reform of the French army was concerned. What were the actual needs um, of of a country like like his own? Um, he excelled in ballet, right, which was considered a very manly thing. Um, and in part that had to do with with training, but you know physical prowess, but still an idea, in fact, of sovereigns as 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 warriors, by a degree. So the uh, the concept of um, let's say war herself as a aristocratic sport, right, of, of self affirmation, it was the true view that laid behind uh, these these figures. Um, was, however, paralleled by an incredibly modern thinking, which is also the, uh, the diametrically opposite view that you're most often told regarding to, um, to so-called absolute monarchs, because there is half of the West that reasons with an incredibly huge bias, at least against it, uh, by default, uh, but quite hypocritically. And that is to say that, of course, sovereigns and the elites, um, generally speaking, uh, are the single most competent elements, actors, agents of the community, right? It, it's difficult for an average 21st century person uh, to understand how the incredibly bloody wars waged by Louis XIV um, could make sense, could be justifiable, or or even just motivated as such, right? But this is not a question you can uh, address, let's say, in fact, without a particular background, without understanding the, the, 
the, the political mechanisms of just the accomplishments of a of the strength that was unlocked from the France for how Louis had found her when he rose to the throne to the time he passed right and um, the good side of modernity the one that needs in fact such gigantic figures like a Sun King uh, to be controlled right is the same one that in fact uh, other figures were not able to handle adequately without even the same community because here we're not talking about a sole man and no uh, no government in the history of mankind could ever rule on anything if they if it hadn't received the decisive moral support of the people thus as you know attitudes like i don't like this guy because he makes war without even distinguishing between say the political reasons of why a war is made um, doesn't have any sense right most people today literally criticize people for making war by closing their eyes for those who actually make it at the same time and just say no that's just a provocation it's not that they would make war otherwise and so they go by that ignoring thus ever more the actual nature of war right i think i will be making a video on soon video commentary on, on this topic soon because um i think the humanity is, is literally going astray like it's, it's being shipwrecked by this kind of anti-war not politically an analytic attitude uh, that is required to understand war as merely a political instrument and just rooting for in, in an incredibly you know ignorant and uncultured and illiterate um, attitude that unfortunately identifies basically the, the overwhelming majority of the people today without any significant exception um, statistically um, exactly as the root cause of mo most of our evil right and uh, this is very transversal both in the left and in the right that practically you know in terms of what they could express they do not understand war by any stretch of the imagination so far but to to level and i'm not exaggerating like i would like to wake up every day meeting a world that at least you know if, even if it w were just for a person out of 10 saying something uh, intelligent um uh, even in that kind of crushing uh, minority i, I would s could still see that the, the power necessary uh, for for fixing stuff but it, it's by far not true right and if it this this were true i would i would see it there is at best some sort of substantial resistance but in terms of formal um efficiency um in a in a in a positive applicational sense uh we're at this point that there is nothing on the horizon and i i think i think we'll we'll crack down soon because uh, you can't literally leave as a citizen if you if you abandon that that I right so of course we are talking today about a period in which uh, citizenry did not exist as such so th the world had already paid for that kind of a lack of awareness and um, say the the, the France uh, of Louis the Fourteenth started still with that background and actually improved sensibly um s starting from the same sun king toward a direction that would reward merit would reward talents would reward also loyalty to the crown but in this kind of redemptional meaning that surely louis was was aware of right for countering as we will see this uh, cynical and demotivated nobility that had made france at that point stagnating actually as most countries in europe at that time for which france would would become actually as the spring um uh, the the mover of, of the world mechanism and as you understand even just making an analysis that would encompass the 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 effect that louis the 14th france had on the uh, basically all, all on the rest of the continent even if it were just military-wise, not even politically or culturally broadly meant, is is enormous, 
right? And today you have to stick just to to the army per se. But we can use this video as an introduction to that um, to that mechanism. Because as we were saying, the Sun King left a mark in history not only for the splendor of his court, for the culture and patronage that have distinguished him and without which m most of his accomplishments also military speaking could have not been possible and the word the expression of a of a greatly revived nation mm -hmm. that had already in, in the past been in fact the, the greatest power in Europe and had this intermittent um uh, in fact uh, setbacks that um were due mostly to the internal dynamics, proving how systemically difficult it was to handle such a big system. And that's why also the all the Apollonian symbolism and the necessity of you know, regaining lost power and reestablishing an order that definitely was not the one that would end up with, with, with the same French Revolution as a denial of the same model. So that that's why things have to be very carefully calibrated in a, in a double thread sense and not just in a single direction as people presume that, that history mostly is. Um, and yet th this is yet in fact another aspect. Louis was the one who made France great. Right? F France in 1648 um, when Louis was still four actually coming um, to the throne and reigning for other 54 years um, the, um, the 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 country was not a great power anymore it may seem strange because seen also especially from, from the perspective of um, of the Holy Roman Empire of you know all the allies that eventually coalesced in spite of their actual radical differences, think about Catholics, Protestants, um, again, countries that had really very few to do with each other in the first place, from from Britain to, to Austria, right from, from Sweden to, to Piedmont, France was actually in very poor shape uh, by the end of the Thirty Years' War, right? Uh, she had actually succeeded clumsily to make the, to, to shipwreck the, the German unification under the Habsburgs that would have fundamentally enforced um, the same type of regime, if not actually a more universally and imperially based one than, than the same France, because we're still living essentially within a medieval um, frame here. Right? It's truly with Louis, as we see, that things change deeply. Um, but also, of course, with the efforts that uh, Louis XIII, uh, Richelieu, Mazzarino had made to um, to prevent, because that was the old um, objective, the compaction of a of of the Holy Roman Empire, right, into a new power, right, that for centuries had been hopelessly fragmented, and that now with the Habsburgs gaining a great power especially not not much per se in Germany but especially also in, in other lands in Central Europe in Hungary uh, in Italy in, in other possessions that um, could definitely hamper the hegemonic ambitions of France it's still the country did have but very often not the means to attain um, would, what was the great the great objective to be obtained with any mean available including siding with the Ottomans and you know that they made several videos about the siege of Vienna and all of it the, the political strategical diplomatic cultural context in Europe and so we analyze the uh, what in, in front of, of a country like France perspectively even in those previous times seemed like the minutiae right of of still feudal in, in intricately feu feudal forests without any hope of centralization such as Austria in, in many ways w still was at this point right um, but what we often forget is that France was particularly vulnerable as well 
right, was not extremely distant from it. Of course, it was a, a country of ancient unity, um, of a, a much more uh, advanced statal, right, in central power, and uh, facilitated by, by other characteristics that somehow you would call geopolitical at this point, but that had always, which is a term that I personally detest because geopolitics does not exist, but um, France had had, say, always very clear objectives, after all, aside from the enormous complexity, in, of course, in handling them. And, in fact, the hegemonic ones of the continent were the primary ones, having a lot of potential, different directions to work to turn so lots of different scenarios to play in at consider we are already in, in a colonial age de facto so the, the wars of, of the sun king uh, would trigger some of the first global conflicts um, as you could call them way before like what what is called in fact the first world war as the seven years war telling the truth um, because, in fact, also of the scale of the country that, that we will see now, that Europe was by far the largest and also the, the most powerful, but still subject to, uh, to infiltrations, to permeations, to potentially a disgregative process, because also France was startled by standards that uh, surely had a lot to do with the, the centralizing process of of the Renaissance, etc., but were still fundamentally uh, private, feudal, by by many degrees. So it was just about the size of that feudal hierarchy that would make the difference between France and the rest of Europe, but not really the essence that was instead changed by the Sun King. And there was no other way for for such a huge land mass uh, with the largest population in Europe and um, an enormous uh, frontier, land frontier, not to attain these objectives through the development of a powerful and efficient army that after all was a bit the goal uh, of all the, all the powers of the time but that required, as we know, a, an enormity of resources that a very few countries had. Not per se, but from a startled point of view, from a central point of view, right? Convincing the subject communities to pay some extras, essentially, for the sake of uh, a political compaction and fundamentally a, a further subjugation that could, however, provide with an important security in an otherwise very unstable, fragmented and tumultuous world where these communities were constantly, in fact, uh, harassed, actually harassing each other um, on a regular basis, was a very difficult enterprise because you lack the mindset for it. Right? It's not that people don't eventually understand that a central rule is more intelligent, is more effective, is more productive, and it can bring to probably an imperial ambition. The problem is uh, resolving the kind of mobster mentality that is the root of any feudal system where every local lord fundamentally wants to rule according to their own prerogatives and without seeing essentially the, the potential that the broader scale offered by states or by empires can provide with just quantitatively speaking. I think the I think colonialism in this had an enormous um, gave an, an enormous contribution because it's not much a matter of material resources, but properly the, the understanding that deriving from the political, strategic, logistic practice, the economic issues and so on, the, the need to exploit every possible resources that simply points to you towards the direction that the more powerful you are and the better it is not just for yourself but practically for anyone because you cannot drive that power but from the people and so if you actually find a way to be concretely powerful it means that you have won people's hearts 
and souls, in a way, and putting together 300,000 men as a statal army, as it was accomplished by Louis XIV, together with Louvois, um, etc., is definitely speaking of that broader consensus that France, in her political and juridical culture, always had. Right? Just depending on the example, at the end of the Middle Ages, already the, the French juridical culture that was fundamentally civil law was attributing, even though it was still within the um, uh, the traditional uh, kind of idea that the, the, the king was there just to respect the, the pre-existing rights of, of the communities, was this idea that you know the, the more powerful the center was and the more stable the country was in many ways. The, across the channel, as you know, it was completely different. Right? The, the monarchy was constantly um, counterbalanced by a private institutional system that hampered dramatically also the the development of what was even in England an importantly powerful monarchy uh, in potential right and you know exactly um, in these uh, in these years what happened the nine years war starting with the same uh, glorious revolution and so at the end of the day the paradox that the civil war uh, had started for you know the the rather miserable and kind of pretty well motivated ship money and ended up with the creation of uh, an army was something like you know had a budget of 10 times more anything that you know uh, could had existed in in uh, in England in by uh, by the mid 17th century right so uh, that necessity of power expansion of centralization of state building uh, is self-evident because it, it's just the need of an authority, a discipline, and an order that, um, given the, the fallen nature of mankind, can hardly be achieved just by asking people politely, right? And say of all the practical benefits that we enjoy today, I think we could be a bit more mindful and uh, appreciative, and rather complaining about. The, the incapacity of people of, st of still, of course, by an important degree of understanding its, its mechanism. Because, yes, it is a way to rule effectively even uh, over, you know, what the average moron thinks. But, you know, there is objectively nothing wrong in doing so, as you understand. Um, so, and that person has always the opportunity in, in these systems to eventually have have a chance which is not what you could give for granted before these times and the artifices of this were not kind of uh, again parliamentary democracies they were actually what we call absolute monarchies they were by the way very far from from any form of ab absolute right um, and that were instead constantly negotiating that kind of uh, avocation of rights in exchange very often for um, you know the the elimination of the of the hated billeting of the troops that was the pre statal way fundamentally to, to maintain some at least some permanent forces in the army for the sake of security that you understand is not a very efficient system at all. And there is a grandiose, to say the least, French military history in Louis XIV's time that set standards, this is also very important as we will see, that we still live up to. But militarily speaking, even in the, the, in the terminology, in, the, in part of the same, think about the same regimental uh, organization and more, that were essentially established in that uniform, statal, um, national permanent sense by the Sun King who won also a thousand battles and enlarged the borders of, of the kingdom again striving for that much greater domination than what just France was in fact this is an aspect that is often overlooked because eventually powers managed more or less to contain each other historically uh, telling you also how 
very intertwined. Europe, of course, w was already, um, but um, that um, that there was striving for a much greater rule and one that had still the possibility of molding another identity because many territories that were conquered by Louis XIV would eventually become what we call French today while uh, in practice um, they weren't right um, so never underestimate there the, the power of uh, nation building through these merciless conquests uh, at the same time but again I will not digress on because I'm sure that every single phrase I make is is uh, misunderstood um, twisted misinterpreted uh, misused whatever because people always tend to I don't know to paranoidly point the finger at the not the the form but the substance so they actually just say look um, this guy invaded this other place so by default that's all you have to know to say this is wrong it depends on who you are why you're doing it who is the other one right there is no universal rule to that which again no it's it's not to cover the Russian back for what is happening in this case quite the contrary right this is exactly the point that we must understand there are superior cultures and inferior cultures and the latter are distinguished from the former from the fact that they lose because they are not superior at all first and foremost from a moral point of view accomplishments true power derive from merit and this is what we should in fact learn right both in the sense in, in attack and in defense if, if we want to think it strategically like that um, and there are many anecdotes about Louis who are uh, very meaningful, right? The, the life of the man is, is very fascinating because, again, aside from the kind of chit-chat, um, ignorant, gossipy attitude towards, you know, the, the intrigues of Versailles that existed at least, but they weren't about, I don't know, what people ate or how uh, rich they were, just, uh, you know, exploiting the poor peasantry or all this kind of stuff let's say there was a which was also a reality but it was actually part of a system that as we just explained uh, was a bit everybody's including the peasantry that had had its shock by the way at some point in history and had lost miserably because they were basically as always nothing even remotely better than the nobility um, we have, in fact, to appreciate, to contextualize. And when Louis was old, ill, and having reached the end of his days, um, he essentially took stock. And looking back over the 54 years of his reign, 34 which had seen him fight to achieve his ambitions in Europe, he, in, in, in the world, he nodded with bitter sincerity that he, quote, had loved war too much. Mm -hmm. For reasons that we will understand now, right, it's, it's hard to tell whether he was right or not about this. Consider that the man was deeply religious, of course. Um, he was, again, well aware of the subtle balance that we were pointing out before between let's say, carrying out a positive enterprise and, you know, miscarrying it in a way or another, maybe not just because of, of a formal defeat, but because of the excessive costs of that. And so that's when a civilization is measured, right? And, you know, when things, of course, appear in all their difficulty, right? So the love for war, per se, was not um, a random expression. War was seen as still in that kind of cosmic uh, dual struggle between good and evil, between, in fact, the, the race of gods and the one of darkness that is properly the non-existence of, of any value, of any life, or of any virtue and capacity. And it's obvious that when you fight for something, uh, 
the measure of your accomplishments, as we were saying, is the the proof of your ability and achievements. And don't think it's was easy by any stretch of the imagination to be a, a sovereign. Right? Being a sovereign is the single most difficult thing that of any other element of, of, of the community by far. Right? There is no comparison between the sufferings of Louis the Fourteenth and the one of any of the uh, of the soldiers that died um, on on the Flemish or or Rhenish or, or Piedmontese uh, battlefields, right, the ones of the king. Uh, of course, uh, the sovereigns bore on himself all of that, right? And there are heartbreaking passages in Louis biography. Uh, also registered by quite quite fascinating by Madame de Maintenon, the, the last let's say um, the, the last mistress. Let's call it in this way. Of course, Louis was married to Maria Theresa of Spain um, uh, all his life, but formerly had, as you know, these other you know loves, mistresses, but also properly companions like uh, Mancini the the Valier, the Montespan, the Maintenon, uh, etc. In the latter, uh, in fact, in the latter phase of Louis' life, also once found him, at least heard behind uh, the door of the king's uh, studio, or, or watching him through uh, a slightly, the slightly open door, the king crying, right over his papers over his his politics over his past over his memory we was struck also by a, a remarkable series of misfortunes uh, the death of his son and heir of uh, many other of his relatives actually in the latter fa phase of his life the de facto uh, failure in the war of spanish succession where he, his ambitions were resized the costs at least um, were too high compared to to the accomplishments um, and thus, this man had to to look to at the at the outcome of his life, what he had to respond God of, and realizing the the enormous loss, the enormous pain, the hundreds of thousands only of of dead soldiers, if not more, um, for his will, right, for his decision, for uh, for for the position that had made him in charge, and, and what a charge, by the way. Um, it, it's very interesting to analyze his character from what we can grasp. He was much of a, he had this kind of military temper, in the sense that, as we will see, he was fascinated and obsessed with warfare, etc. He was not much of a commander at all. Um, but um, he was also, by, by nature, first of all, a, a cold man. Right, his life was quite hard. First, first of all, you understand that these sovereigns were never alone. They didn't have really a, a moment in which they could be truly themselves. Their etiquette, that was in this case also self-imposed, self-created, articulated, was all woven around the the gigantic system and, and powers and, and forces that the same sovereign had to keep under. Uh, Louis was surely a very um, straightforward, um, cold, calculating, firm, self-aware individual. And, and what is uh, extraordinary in some ways is a bit an exception, actually, that all the greatest names of his political and military making were, in a way or another, the same paste, right? Very cold, pragmatic, methodic, cautious, not overly cautious, because, in fact, uh, the wars themselves showed this, but still deeply aware of the practical nature of these actions and the necessity of, you know, not um, stretching too far, right? Which could have brought to the fall of France, right? We often don't picture this practically, but all these powers at the time were always a step away from destruction, right? There wasn't a France 
of this great army, this power of Vauban's fortifications, we will see now, and it's okay, you, you don't get it. Paris could, could fall, as it had risked to do during, during the, the Italian wars, as it actually would in Napoleonic times and beyond, right? Um, they were always fighting. Uh, you, you can't distinguish whether from kind of invading another country or preventing their country to be invaded. Right, um, especially in this time, right? There are cases in history which this is evidently not true, or at least even if you receive a damage that can lead to further uh, kind of uh, power decrees. Of course, you you understand what the political strategic motivations are, but here we're specifically talking about the possibility of allied armies. By the way, the basically the entire Europe coalized against France, something that we found again again, in, in the time of the Italian wars, of the Napoleonic wars, because that was really the hegemonic power that had uh, the force of, of achieving that. And um, this is what is highlighted, in my opinion, the most from Louis' reign, that we can envy by a certain degree. I personally love France. It was there, like, so many times. It's like a second home to me, and um, it's um, it's so beautiful just to to, to visit places like Versailles or Vaux-le-Vicomte or Fontainebleau and other um, residences of that kind of thinking about this, I don't know the sparkling parties in the sumptuous palaces the innumerable mistresses which especially as you understand for a young man is, is uh, quite of an appeal right by by nature um, but um always considering that even these aspects um sexually speaking actually speak of the intoxication of political power or of absolute power behind um uh, let's say a love uh, a relationship at least there was never kind of mere feelings even when love did actually exist uh, but political promotion by uh, let's say intrigues in fact some very dangerous ones you can imagine all the, the spy stories behind this you have all read hopefully the Dumas works um, we have seen them even in, in the courts in the in this circles in, in again for even determining that the incredibly complicated game of alliances and so on that we tend to even just uh, deterministically say, okay, well, more or less it was this country with this other country, etc. But the more you dig into that, you always realize that uh, there was always at least two sides within the same place that were, and there were actually many others, were constantly influenced by many other powers. Speaking also of, of, in reflecting naturally that aforementioned political fragmentation for which you didn't really have anything like one country as such right even at this level of strong elite power you always had different currents um, relations with different countries you had to give priority to by some degree moment in another uh, a sovereign died you had to claim inheritance but that other country had told you you couldn't do it because i don't know maybe in europe it was in that way but in the americas it was in another you were carrying out this policy and that action would provide you with some advantage maybe militarily but not economically i mean um it's of of such a degree of complexity again the all the 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 mass of that burden we were talking about before if if it were just for merely you know knowing what the hell was going on with 17th century 17th 18th century uh, means of communication is of enormous difficulty and yet as we've seen enormous things were also accomplished so this speaks enormously of 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 the same moral size of, of the individuals involved. But this aspect of love for war, right? Louis XIV loved war per se. And those words that we quoted before, spoken on his deathbed in a pretty painful one, because Louis basically wrote uh, alive, right? Um, and it, it, it's his death is it's dramatically bitter also because uh, by that point he had um, exhausted France with wars so that 
his funeral, uh, like in order to bury him at um, Saint Denis, he they had to make the coffin pass through Paris at night so that nobody would would, would know it, because otherwise the, the 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 people, the angry mob, would have assaulted um, uh, the wagon. Uh, I mean, this tells you how even dark, of course, the manner of this man really was. And uh, you, we have seen, especially from mostly an Habsburgic perspective, speaking of Vienna, um, the, in fact, the shrewdness, the cold blood, and this absolutely cynical way of thinking uh, to the point of let's even favor the Ottoman for, for the siege, because even if Vienna falls, France uh, will have with lots of problems to cope with, or at least will have knocked out her immediate major problem and when you start realizing in fact from, from the French side of the story you, you understand that um, this wasn't an evil even if we want to, um, to, to of course to dramatize to almost fictionalize to romanticize these realities but everybody was working really behind the scenes in, in the same ways right and some even just maybe were more sticking to, to the ideal but not necessarily were more effective for their people, um, for for even their own dynasty, even that nobody really cared from this aristocratic perspective about the the rest uh, of the population in the way we, we intend. Where, but they were, of course, understood as a mean to an end. It was a universal meaning in that hierarchy and that God had... Uh, uh, not just wanted it, but rendered it possible in the first place. And as we've seen, I made a couple of months ago a bit about the uh, the, the French uh, scissor of papism and in the imperial nature of, of the French monarchy. And in fact, a state like France, especially when, again, led by such a strong-willed uh, figure, uh, will had properly committed himself to, to restore the monarch in all her greatness well you realize that um, the relation with God himself uh, in the face also an alliance with uh, with the Ottomans with in this kind of impious fetus as it was known at the time was first of all that had always done by the French uh, as long as the Ottomans had threatened the, the Habsburgs um, etc. It was kind of a broader and kind of obvious necessity but again speaking of the man it definitely put him uh, under a dramatic pressure we can't avoid to think that it's because of that policy that he may have thought that his uh, son the Grand de Fond would uh, had died and so many others uh, of his also possible heirs um, all at once as a sort of um, sort of curse right and that was seen obviously in a, in a divine perspective so the price of failure and we will never know how how hard it was to be king in, in these matters um, so dying with this bitterness and feeling the need to pronounce these words we, we, we get there a sentence of actually a very moral man because he could have said I did what I have to do I don't I don't think about it even in the moment of death because um, I'm sure God he had felt the scale of not necessarily of the failure but of at least of the failure measured through the level of ambition that he had wanted to to anchor Nate and to mold the world life and I think that is more relevant than than many other considerations. Um, he summarized his reign and his most lasting legacy in in history like that, right? Voltaire, that you know, is a quite um, person so generous. Let's say, said that it was certain that the wars of Louis XIV um, had um, been fought because the sovereign passion longed for glory more than the conquests themselves. Um, and there is actually a, a pinch of truth 
um, of course, in it because uh, Voltaire was understanding it in, in a different way. But the, the love for glory it can never be disjuncted from the actual accomplishment, morally speaking. Right? We're not just thinking about uh, war in terms of, you know, pieces of land or even number of subjects that you acquired or that you lost in that manner. We are talking about something that evidently went beyond in France, especially in terms of state building and possibility of further, you know, defense or offense internationally still with, with that role that, in fact, the, the country maintained till, till today because we're talking the fact about the, the strongest military uh, in Europe. Louis of Bourbon, we're still talking about Capetians, you know, that we talk about Valois, Valois Burgundy, Valois Angoulême, uh, Bourbon, it, they are still all branches of the Capetian dynasty that in the sense never really had, uh, let's say, biological reproductive problems, um, was crowned king when he was just four years old. And already at that age, he had showed his uh, his character. Stamp. Of course, these children were properly raised in the full awareness of their future role. He was the oldest son of Louis the Thirteenth. Um, he had also another brother, you know, Philip. But he always had been heir apparent, and allegedly, when um, he was brought on his father's deathbed, the dying sovereign said, um, tell me, my son, wh what is your name? And and the young Louis said, Louis XIV. <laughs> and, and Louis XIII said, not yet, my son, not yet. Uh, th th that's the kind of uh, self-awareness, definitely, that, um, that he would always maintain. Because Louis wasn't, he wasn't even, like, even particularly tall or, you know, particularly even beautiful, like you would think, an attractive man or something. But all, all contemporaries agree on the fact that he was surrounded by, by a charisma, an aura, a fascinum, that would immediately, even just in this um, crowded courts in which kings also dress more or less similarly to, to the others, was immediately recognizable. Like, you knew he was the king, because he had that royalty just uh, infused in him, right? So, and he always uh, actually was up to the standards in that regard. He set there an example that was also made by this, as we've seen, strong, hardcore, also cold character. Um, and, however, rising to the throne at his father's death at only four years old, he came to absolute power only in 1661, at the death of the Cardinal Giulio Raimondo Mazzarino, um, uh, that ended the, the Italian phase of, of, of the French uh, monarchy, fundamentally. And uh, Car Cardinal to whom his mother, Anne of Austria, had entrusted the effective government of the country after she had remained a uh, widow, right? In quite harsh times, right? Uh, Louis was born in 1643, he came to power in 1648, um, and so we're talking about uh, pretty serious moments for, for, for France, because um, there were some consequences to the Thirty Years' War and also the front that, as we will see, was a wake-up call for the French monarchy, because there were two fronts, actually, one of, of Paris and one of the nobility that molded Louis' awareness of, of, of that reality, and that's partly also the reason why he escaped the Louvre, uh, from which apparently he didn't like to, to look at on the distance Saint-Denis, the, the place of his future burial, as you know, being the, the royal... Um, the royal church and much more actually than that. Uh, of course, there is Saint Germain des Prés, um, but then Saint Denis is France, right? Um, that's where the kings are buried, where the orange flam is raised, um, and um, 
France, in the truest meaning of the country and the European identity, is purely and exclusively Saint Denis. Saint Denis is France and, and France is Saint Denis. And nothing else, like there is nothing else outside of Saint Denis as France. Always remember this. Um, and he escaped to Versailles, that as you know was part of a very shrewd, clever mechanism, not just of enormous international prestige and aggrandizement just out of the sheer scale of civilizational accomplishment in, in the divine beauty of, of, of the palace, of the garden and so on, but because primarily it was a political mean to attract uh, in that court from all the country the nobility that thus would have had to be disciplined, educated, conformed, etiquette within uh, the same uh, the same palace to to uh, in competing in winning the graces of the king uh, and thus kind of growing ever more um, obedient and s subjected and kind of controllable um, and it would be only after Cardinal Mazzarino's death on March the 9th 1661 that the young Louis was able to govern independently, right? And uh, the Italian influence had been, as you know, very, very strong culturally. Uh, Louis spoke Italian as fluently as, as, uh, as, as in French. You know, he spoke other languages. Uh, well, the same French sovereigns were somehow uh, Italian in their, kind of in their bloodline, but it was, I mean, the, the cultural influence of of the peninsula from, from the renaissance that had set these all the standards politically military artistically scientifically etc linguistically in europe and the creation of a strong france entailed now in fact the creation of a true um, monarchic national culture that in fact found um, uh, in in louis the, the greatest promoter of probably a, a french um, a French dimension, right? That was, by in fact, the 18th century to supplant Italian as the uh, language of of modern Europe, right? Um, this uh, this aspect tells you even just by scale how much dysfunctionally unexploited cultural potential France had, because of the lack of a truly compact monarchy and uh, also passing, in fact, truly dra somehow very corrupt and inefficient military system that we'll see in a while, but how far-ranging and comprehensive Louis reforms really were. Mm -hmm. um, consider this, that with 18 million inhabitants, France was then by far the most populous nation in Europe. It had kind of always been in this enormously based uh, Atlantic, fertile, uh, fatly, rich, agriculturally speaking, um, Atlantic plains um, uh, that had the, the greatest amount of concentration politically wise, meaning that uh, the French monarchy had fundamentally developed this kind of a, a Atlantic power, right, controlling that the side of, of, of the this enormous river valleys whose surplus had allowed, in fact, the French nobility to to, to to be born, to grow, to develop since Gallo-Roman times, the Merovingian conquest, uh, and so on. Uh, Habsburg, Austria, just comparatively had 8 million inhabitants, Spain and England 6 uh, each. Um, but as the same Louis noted in his memoirs in France, disorder reigned supreme. A large and prosperous country, at the forefront, especially by agricultural development, as as you understand it, the r French rural resources were immense, and also well established actually in commercial and industrial development. As a consequence, and considering the colonies, the general, you know, the, the Western European uh, setting, so was of course a, a modern country in many ways. But Fran France was devoid, actually, of political weight. You would say, how? France, right? The same country that 
uh, unleashed enormous uh, military power right in in the hundred years war stepping in the Rhineland putting in crisis the same Holy Roman Empire literally creating out of scratch Swedish military power uh, with, with, with its money uh, yes uh, France didn't have uh, in, in relative terms to her you know size and resources a political weight worth of this name right the country was still feudal in its most intimate structure right with a fragmented power in the hands of a noble class with no other ambitions than to keep their privileges and, and not much more right that's a bit the the problem you're rich you own a lot of lands why would you even invest too much in that if you can't simply um you know leave even internationally as as a peer of the broader nobility and thus sharing power like that it's a bit like what what very different times we can argue that nobility had been born in christina in a nightly sense in europe in the 10th century where everything was fragmented it was not even an empire or or functional kingdoms anymore uh, but a sense of of nobility um, was shared by the various rulers of Europe already at the time. Um, the compaction of a state is something else. It's coercing these forces right, for a common objective that, of course, war can provide with in terms of the opportunities deriving from political territorial expansion, consolidation of power, and the further hierarchization of the system. Do you want to rise above the other nobility? Yes. How? Um, so the front that we mentioned before had showed all the dangers of a nobility that uh, naturally distrusted anyone would, would, however, wanted to rise above themselves in a way. Um, so before we, the, the fort, as we've seen, um, it was Mazzarino who governed the fate of France. Um, his policy, however, un unleashed the revolt of the parliament and the nobility, known as the Fronde, for the fact that the Parisians stormed the cardinal's windows with slingshots, interestingly enough. Um, so Louis and his mother at that point were forced to flee the city. Right At this point, the young king was deeply marked by the events. He was just a kid, but those are the formative years. Those are the things we do not forget. Um, and the thing was made worse by the fact that his cousin, the Prince of Condé, the Duke of Bourbon, the hero of the Battle of Rocroix, had actually participated to the rebellion. Together initially with the Marshal of France, Henri de la Tour d'Auvergne, the Viscount of Touraine that we will see in a while, when in fact, as we were saying before, one of the greatest commanders in modern history, who, however, passed back to the side of, of the monarchy and defeated the Condé um, at the outskirts of Paris. Um, Condé, as we will see, will have a time of uh, distancing from, the, from Paris, because Louis naturally... Uh, punished him, like pr from preventing him to gain other, other power, but um, he eventually pardoned his cousin because he had already distinguished himself in, in important engagements, but would become further uh, one of his most successful generals um, in the later years, interested in the invasion of, of, of the Netherlands, etc., once the front was defeated, Louis gradually er, approached effective power, which he attained, however, again, at the death of the cardinal. Um, Louis, at the death of Mazzarino, was then still pretty young, merely 18, and his advisors thought that they could somehow control him to appoint a new prime minister, and thus replicating the the older system at that point Louis said in front of the question of your, your majesty will will you appoint as your prime minister he answered I will be the prime minister 
as he was well aware of the disadvantages that would come from the monarchy, with a weak monarch, of course, so much so that he began to work busily every day for the rest of his life, embodying the perfect example of what it meant to be, in fact, um, a virtuous monarch at the time, a pretty strong, resolute, pretty capable and skilled one, given that he had literally taken all matters of, of the state in his own hands, and which allowed, in fact, a unity of power that uh, had been unprecedented even in such a, as we've seen, <laughs> vertically projected um, country like France, politically and institutionally. Thus, Louis began to mold um, France in his own image, and he started exactly with the army. To become the Sun King, Louis had to give a goal to that cynical and demotivated nobility, and he succeeded by imposing on them first, but also on all the people the duty of putting themselves at the service of the crown and fulfilling his dreams of a bigger and more powerful France. Right? How can you achieve power without hard work in any case? Right? And in this Louis was the inventor of, of the very concept there to all French of grandeur. Right? Up to that point, France had definitely embodied it in, in many ways. Uh, the flower of Christian cavalry, this, in fact, exasperated sense of the, the highest nobility um, in the continent. But the true greatness of France as a country started exactly with Louis. It's as if he had been the nation himself, and surely as an ancien regime, monarch, that's exactly what he was called to literally incarnate, right, um, and spiritually and bodily, literally. So, uh, one can never stress enough the personal rule of Louis, uh, also in, naturally, uh, the, the manifestation through his extremely skilled uh, officials, right, ministers, generals, and so on. Without him, they would have never found the place that they deserved. Definitely, Louis surrounded himself also with great talents that would help him carry out his enormous project. It's obvious that the military commitment in particular, was the premise of a long season of wars that, in fact, would stop in France for a decade or so after his death, because literally, th not just France, but as a consequence, the entire group had you know, bled herself white. And Louis XIV's territorial objectives were ambitious, right? And they were, as we were saying at the beginning, also pretty simple and concrete and coherent. The extension of France on what he considered her natural borders from the Rhine in the east to the Pyrenees in the south, right? As we have seen also in the, in the other videos about the same, the same period from an Habsburgic perspective, but dating back to the Middle Ages, um, France was, of course, the main continental power. In Europe, this enormous land mass and population that consequently had forced the, de uh, the, the, the development of a strong terrestrial military culture that the same Louis would extend dramatically, would be reinforced to standards that remain, in fact, the highest in Europe for a long time to come throughout the, the 18th century uh, and, and beyond, because, you know, just thinking about the Napoleonic Wars, were same product of the of the French royal army and even after actually 
I don't know, the, the, the Franco-Prussian War, um, uh, the, the French military, and still today, right, in a continuous line, in spite of the, the jokes of defeat, surrender, whatever, um, embodies one of the single most uh, high military standards in the world. So um, this owes much to, to Louis. Um, and naturally, with what was already an impressive set especially of potential, as we've seen in uh, in the country itself. Um, and this aspect is, is fascinating, because as we were reminding before, the French army was in the worst possible condition at that time. Only 70,000 men, undisciplined, poorly trained, subjected to a corrupt and inefficient hierarchy. Right. So, in order to, even just presuming, to have the capability of projecting uh, himself further uh, in in the Rhineland, especially, but also in Italy, that the other um, important uh, valve of vent of, of, of France historically, um, it took to reshape the the entire system. Right. Um, in, in thirty years of war not all with a favorable outcome for France, the Sun King considerably enlarged the borders of his kingdom. I mean, even at the cost of incurable economic crises, annexing an impressive amount of land, Alsace, that is French even today, even though it was historically German, as you know, not more nor less, Metz, Toul, Roussillon, Artois, the French Flanders, Cambrai, so all this di in, in the northeast, um, these objectives uh, embodying also an old French ambition since the time, arguably, of um, you know of the first French kings, um, but uh, since the 14th century, right, the preferred direction is quite rich uh, and entrepreneuring centers. Actually, France wouldn't make it to to conquer the Netherlands because those were the 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 most evident objective the uh, the occupation of the Rhineland the Rhine mouth and the the destruction of uh, essentially at that point the the strongest uh, navy uh, in in Europe and in uh, in this regard failing in fact badly as you know that the Dutch put up a resistance they flooded even their own country even to prevent the French uh, stepping in um, uh, further and uh, we're talking about atrocious um, casualties from, from both sides in this regard um, we will talk about the Dutch army exactly in the time of Louis XIV because at this point it was the in terms of cost benefit ratio economically speaking the single most effective army in history right economically wise right in terms of property of cost benefit because it was simply a business right the Dutch wouldn't see it in any other way um, and it prevented the French from conquering the country interestingly enough but there were other lands in the um, kind of in fact in the direct east the county of Burgundy the Isar region its minor resources the Eno lower Alsace um, and uh, as you understand, this was a, a huge push towards de facto imperial lands, because the the Dutch, as you know, had become independent. We were de facto es essentially some secessionists from the broader uh, what was at least the kingdom of Germany, aside from the broader Holy Roman Empire. France had the rich but um, hopelessly fragmented the Rhineland to just step in across the border. Um, there was much closer to France in the sense that in the same Austria within Germany, interestingly enough, and there was a huge, in fact, game there played that we made m m multiple videos about, like, which which part was the, the, the one to, to pursue for the Habsburgs, like the pro-Spanish one that wanted to, um, to go towards the Rhineland, because thus... Um, it would re release French pressure from from the Pyrenees, or in fact the probably the imperial one, also the one more supported by the papacy, that is the one against the Turk, that was threatening the same capital later on. 
So it's impossible to resume in a few words the all the wars, and campaigns, and battles fought by the French army under Louis XIV. But there are some important, um, say the, the the war, the most important wars are somehow famous. The war um, of the Revolution, uh, the the Holy Alliance slash the the Nine Years War, um, the the Grand Alliance, the War of Spanish Succession. Right, the the Dutch War proper, um, and from 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 these, it's um, uh, already interesting to look at some specific clashes that I presume you're not really a European if you don't know. For example, the Battle of Senef. Here, I would like to list just like at least the scale of the losses from both sides to make you understand properly the bloodbath of these. Of these encounters. Uh, Senef is, is in Belgium. It was fought on August the 11th, 1674. The French were commanded by uh, the Grand Condé, Louis II of Bourbon Condé, um, against Prince William III of Orange, mm. stadtholder of, of, of the Netherlands. So this was essentially the French, because they were mostly, again, against. Uh, everyone in, in that regard um, against uh, some German states Spain that at the time as you know was not yet um, Bourbon it was still Habsburgic so uh, there would be this switch right that uh, Louis was able to impose dynastically after the death of Charles II making his grandson Spanish uh, throne with however the, the promise that uh, France and Spain would have not been dynastically unified as a sum under a same king and that's when um, the sun king said il n'y a plus de Pyrénées because historically like the the mountains had always been that kind of frontier between France and Spain and now instead Spain passed together with all her like um, you know Italy the Americas everything still under its dependence to the French side which triggered in fact uh, further clashes the, the, the war the Spanish succession and so on so this the same w war of devolution the, there were lots of um, you know also obscure um, illegal claims that um, literally we in, in enacted just by putting together all various juridical experts studying even the, the oldest medieval uh, rights over this or that land dynastic like just to say um, like the the wars of reunion this is how they were called too right especially in the Rhineland saying one, once in a point in time this this fief had belonged to the king of France because of this dynastic thing and, and just an excuse to invade and conquer these areas and naturally, again, under important pressure of the various neighbors at the same time, and with enormous gains also politically, confessionally, um, at this point, kind of every country tends to be, you know, with its own national confession. But, as you know, still in Louis times, with the revocation of the Nut Edict, the expulsion of the Huguenots, uh, the Draconat, etc., importantly connected with the army, because the army there was billeted in the Huguenot communities to, to, to oppress them, etc., was still far from being accomplished in an homogeneous sense. But aside from this, at the Battle of Senef, of 44,000 French, 8,000 became casualties, and, and of 65,000 allies, 20,000 became casualties. This was, the, the, I think, the bloodiest battle of, of the century. And just, um, I think what it means just to participate to a battle where tens of thousands of people are killed, maimed, uh, whatever. So this was actually a French victory, as you understand, also from, from the losses. Um, and, but it was hardly fought, because the tactics at that time, as you know, were mm, quite... Um, I can't say even repetitive, they were somehow devoid of particular dynamism. We were still in technically pike and shot times, and 
as we were saying before at the end of the live um, linear tactics had kicked in but there were huge and will do bulky armies even when they they increase like towards mostly the ma just the, the predominance of the musketry element that by the logistics of the time it was greatly enhanced especially in french armies that made school all over europe were still ho however enormously unwieldy right there were armies literally 100,000 men concentrated in the same place causing a carnage even just because of the just muscle to muscle dynamic that was going to happen because of the unwieldiness of the whole thing. In fact, after the War of Spanish Succession and the death of the Sun King, as you know, the European art of war transitioned towards somehow more, somehow smaller, more compact armies that would also try to to increase the the maneuverability, the the mobility. Because the bats of blood of the early 18th century in Flanders, you know, had uh, literally showed the, you know, even, of course, the, the, the enormous strategic importance of the same. Marlborough used to say that j just for a single battle, at that point, you would take 12 fortresses, right, as an equivalent. Um, but they had become unbearable to sustain on the longer run. And this had happened, of course, for logical reasons. Um, um, because French expansionism had er, made forces rush just for the sake of, you know, stemming this enormous gigantic army without, you know, spending, having too, mu too much possibility to, to think about other tactical sophi or strategic sophistication, right? So um, I made some video here and there once I made a question and answer video on the Battle of Mount Plaquet. I will see in a while, too, in terms of losses. And you realize they were just these two sides very often meeting, not, not even achieving um, a decisive result, just bleeding themselves white and then leaving the field, very often claiming victory. Because, again, if you didn't route the entire system, which was hardly possible, with also with this prevalent, brutal prevalence of infantry um, and, and firepower uh, that somehow made it, complicated just to advance further uh, against the start of resistance that was based on more the position and layers of of of, of uh, fact of of soldiers and so on in depth for not talking about uh, also artillery that was considerably increased by the la Valier system uh, under louis uh, that lasted until Gribeval was quite quite effective thus for, for a long time, and and uh, it was just a matter of where do we hit next and try to break next. It, and that in in battles like this, for example, Mount Plaquet, we have seen it literally. If the Allies had won, the way of Paris was open, right? So these were major battles uh, on which depended literally an enormous political and strategic assets and. The word thus worth being fought, which is something that people today tend to dismiss in a kind of anti-war sense. But, you know, if people fight wars, it's because there is something at stake, right, from both sides and uh, for the laws of reciprocity. So if you don't see that, you're, you're very dumb. And you also contribute unavoidably either to one side or the other by not wanting to have anything to do with that. Um, and importantly enough, generals at this point risked their own life. The Duke of Enghien, for example, saved the life of his father, the Saint Louis II of Bourbon Condé at the Battle of Senef. Right, so um, the Saint Touraine, as you know, died on, uh, on the Rhine, killed by, by a cannonball. Um, and uh, that's the, the scale of danger that of course existed. Even in times where commanders were kind of ever more sheltered from in say the from direct in involvement in battle but still like especially in the early period of Louis um reign like uh, he also had to r routinely and because he loved that as we've seen also participate to the battles in some way right being present at it giving some orders sometimes also by his own initiative quite, quite disastrously so um but just being there showing 
the great winner on horseback arriving and bringing his own imperium over over his battling soldiers uh, during the Dutch war um, there was the battle of Ensheim in Alsace uh, this battle was fought on October the 4th 1674 it's one of Turin's battles against Prince Alexander von Bournonville um, so it was essentially a French Habsburgic struggle you know that also Turin and Monte uh duels have are uh, you know the ABC of modern strategy manuals were studied by everyone by, by Frederick the second by 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 Prince Eugene before him by von Clausewitz and so on uh, they really made school um, in this battle there was another French victory the French uh, lost 3,500 men and the Imperial 4,000 out of respectively 38,000 uh, excuse me 22,000 38,000 in the War of the Grand Alliance uh, b between 1688-1697, the Battle of Marsaglia was fought near Turin. Uh, this was yet another French victory, the one scored by the Marshal Nicolas Catina, we will talk about him in a while, on the Duke Victor Amadeus II of Savoy. At this point, he was fundamentally signing with with the Habsburgs had been convinced to do so. I made a couple of videos about this context, especially about the Valdensians, but also something pertaining to Prince Eugene. We'll talk about it again. Um, so th this was uh, essentially a French army of 35,000 fighting against 30,000 Spanish and Savoy guards, because, of course, the, the Spanish still had um, the uh, Lombardy right, and other Italian possessions. Casualties were 18,000 French and 10,000 Allied ones. Finally, the Battle of Malplaquet fought during the War of Spanish Succession of 1702-1713 in uh, effectively it's today's France. It's on September 11th, 1709. So the Duke de Villars and the Duke of Boufflier um, essentially containing an allied army of huge proportions like we're talking about something between 100 120,000 allies against 90,000 French and even though this was namely an allied victory because the French eventually abandoned the field the allied lost 25,000 men while the French only let's say 12,000 these were enormous baths of blood Right, um, and again, tactics were that that wild. It wasn't just um, at this point uh, linear tactics having kicked in properly in the in the mode of war. So just having these uh, these soldiers in 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 uh, wigs and makeup standing in front of, of each other, like shooting each other down, and musketry fire remaining firm, rigid, and the French had contributed enormously. To this, like before, soldiers didn't quite fight like that, and thus remaining solidly under musketry, mitraille fire. There were also, in fact, little very physical assaults, storming processes were you know abs obstacles. Of course, they had to be crossed with pontoons, storming with grenades. So it was extremely bloody. Cavalry was also very starting to be very punching in this battlefield, mostly operating on the flanks, but not only. But very often also. Uh, getting bogged down, like at at time, um, by the heavy ground and, uh, and still infantry gaining ever greater firepower was difficult to, to break, right? And that made, of course, infantry still the the decisive arm in spite of this cavalry coming back. So I think just these four examples can tell you like the dimension of of uh, of, of brutality. On, on a battlefield of these times and again people mock this l kind of libertine eccentric fashionable nobility or aestheticism but this was actually part of a broader kind of contempt towards um, 
you know the the lowness of 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 the world and of this in otherwise incredibly brutal um context in which uh in fact this same noblemen were called to perform some of the most radically violent tasks um you know duels were all over the place as we've seen discipline the nobility was a huge issue here um matters of honor were came before anything else right how many young aristocrats killed themselves in this uh, in these duels but also how many just were in love with war just like with louis and uh, just leaving for serving out of personal political religious conviction we're all one we've seen it in the series with about prince eugene um and stand again standing under enemy fire without any uh any wavering just because that's what we were you were expected to do as a nobleman in the world of the time so even voices of sexual ambiguity this kind of thing very often were not even true right they were also voices as always put um around for example prince eugene we have seen that he was credited saying you know he was homosexual but he, there were for example louis brother philip was actually was were other uh even actually great men of war that were notorious homosexuals but at least others were probably weren't like the, their lifestyle this kind of um intense um passion this this need for sublimating right this is typical of of the baroque era in many ways it was a way to test to initiatically um prove uh, one's moral force right and mm, there were lots of voices that were just put around to in fact to to discredit the the figure the, the person right about prince eugene just by political rivals and by the way it's quite unlikely that the ultra pious Habsburgs would ever taken at court and made field marshal and uh, at the end of the, the head of, of of the armed forces a man with such a libertine so a promiscuous past right also he, he wouldn't even get ever married but very often what we don't understand of these figures is that the worst raised in such a traumatic reality just even r the rigidity of the codes of the etiquette it was even war was a way to vent right even this excess this 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 feasts these um night uh nights out in you know dueling um getting drunk uh, or you know carrying the, doing the, the even the most vicious things in forms of torture or our um you know extravagances or intrigue you know, we're all part of this clienterly world where everybody was competing wildly right reaching the top and being ready to to get in the the, the highest in fact being interested with the highest offices and honors and especially commands in this rising uh, states especially in france that uh, was by far the, the the course of which was by far the most prestigious in the first place um, and this took a form a pretty crude concrete one in in war right on the battlefield in the enormous um amount of men and material mobilized and sent to to the front um in this endless sieges mostly but also this uh pitched bloodbaths that we have just documented uh, in particular louis aims on the eastern side of his kingdom concerned french speaking territories some sort like uh, artois lorraine uh, French Comte, and this derives from the fact that the region, since medieval times, had always remained politically blurred. Right, there were parts of the Holy Roman Empire that were French-speaking historically. There had even properly been French emperors, such as I don't know Henry the Seventh of Luxembourg. Um, they also came to rule over a Slavic kingdom, and at the time, it was the most powerful in the empire. So, of course, m the multicultural dimension was normal in a universal perspective. But Louis thought that 
the areas that were at least French, um, you know, hosting some significant French, m even minority, right, c or majority at the end of the day, were more easily assimilable within within France. It would fundamentally create this further layer of um, like like buffer territory to shelter the the French heartland, right? Um, but Louis ambition went far beyond this, also towards uh, provinces historically extraneous to the history of France, such as the Spanish Flanders and Alsace, right? Um, the, the reason being fundamentally the same, the, the expansion vector was the, the same one, so politically and strategically still made an important sense. There was also the confessional card to play. Um, very often, uh, the the same Protestant princes would more likely support um, France in Germany, for example, than than the Habsburgs because mm, they preferred to remain fundamentally in a decentralized position of some sort of also proximity with France than then under the, the the Catholic policy of the Habsburgs, because the French would at least m maintain um, the they didn't care about the, the religious divide per se, or at least it was not their duty to discipline the Holy Roman Empire, because those territories would have still somehow remained as part of the Holy Roman Empire, and it was just a way to, to vulnerate the same universal symbol of the Habsburgs to say, look, I can't step in the Rhineland and even treat your subjects better um, than you do, and especially the Protestant ones. And so reinforcing actually the Protestant reaction to the Habsburgs in, in within the same Germany. That was huge and, as you know, politically fragmented, right, um, in lots of, of small states. So it was uh, an intricate forest to get in just politically or strategically, from Vienna when the Turks were basically besieging the, the capital there and not even threatening the, the German heartland. At least, you know, of course, it, it was important for many, even German Protestants, to, to participate to the siege of Vienna because it was, first of all, a chance again to shine, I guess, this exalted fanatic aristocrats who wanted just to compete with each other to get a command and making fortune and career and glory um, and 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 more because it wasn't just that it wasn't just a matter of socio-economical promotion it was literally proving to be what what a nobleman was meant to be to fight right to fight for an, a, a universal ideal of some sort even though reality was quickly changing in a world where universalism was disgregating um, but in a broader sense, um, uh, the um, the Habsburgs were weaker than France, and so they were kind of also m more in difficulty in, in the first place, and preferred wisely to concentrate at least at some point, uh, um, say, uh, not too late on the on the Turkish problem, but also after the failure of, of the siege of Vienna basically gave ground on an enormous amount of Central Europe up to the Danube and beyond, then, then in Germany that would have created arguably much more problems. Then of course most of these wars were fought across uh, the same Germany, mostly in, in, uh, in Flanders with their mostly a Dutch and British support to the Habsburgs. Because um, these powers, at least, were distant enough not to see Habsburgic expansionism as much of a problem. But as we've seen, the greater issue in the first place was France, right? Um, that very often didn't even get along, at least particularly with the uh, with the papacy, right? At least formally, was a Catholic power. But as you know, through Gallicanism and this de facto support of the Ottomans against the Habsburgs uh, in a concrete political sense it was going uh, was doing at least something different um, and internal and this the, the 
the different uh, dimension of, of these problems is given by the fact that Louis some struggled to get rid of, of the Protestants in France, which also actually made the country lost a, a an important amount of uh, skilled laborers and entrepreneurs and even just subjects um, that fled to kind of poorer, more brutally primitive countries like Prussia and so on and helped the construction of a state there. Uh, they're also more tolerant Catholic countries. Um, and that while consolidating French political unity and deprived France also of some important resources. But again, it was a balance there that you have to understand. And in, in the perspective of such a big country where uh, it's easier for minorities, especially on, on the, in the periphery, to, to nest in a kind of dangerous fashion. And we've seen it in the video about the Valdensians and the war against Piedmont, because there, there was a, a very shrewd um, a, a Savoyard and kind of allied policy because it was within the, the nine years of war context uh, that uh, you know brought uh, the the protestants to reactivate and in fact the, the very southeast of france right in areas where also kind of mountainous where guerrilla could be enacted could could really harm the country so nothing must be evaluated just by saying okay well this Doing this is bad in absolute terms, so Louis the Fourteenth was bad. Um, Louis was the most aware of this balance, and he would just take the the measure that favored the strengthening of France, and that's what the raison d'état, in many ways, is about. Um, and but more importantly, Louis put the balance between the powers of the European nations at stake, because many countries starting from the Netherlands but also in general also in the colonies right the opportunity for other powers to expand in some areas that not were somehow um, jeopardized um, all the great continental powers of Europe thus coalesce to counter France that under Louis had resumed an explicitly hegemonic project France was meant there to rule over Europe entirely. It's a bit what happened during Napoleonic times. France had the means that had been unlocked by the right leadership with unprecedented power. Because this was modifying literally the way not just war was made, but consequently states were built. That's also the reason why Britain uh, dramatically developed uh, her army at this point because uh, w what was at stake was eventually also much more important than you know, um, any concern at that point of the parliament actually to, to invest more in such uh, enterprises for, for the Netherlands it was just a matter of, of survival the same goes for Piedmont uh, the same goes for other smaller kind of for example German states that began to realize especially after uh, the Treaty of Westphalen, a bit of the, their own roles within um, this, what was considered a weak area, just like Italy, like uh, as a battleground of Europe, and that now felt to be exposed between these giants, right, and began to consolidate some greater position. But here, France could threaten, say, under threat entire, entire countries. For example, during the, uh, the Thirty Years' War, Bavaria had being jointly attacked by the French, by the Swedes. I mean, there, there was a capacity there to wipe out entire entire countries, which historically had not yet happened, at least so easily, right, or so put in such a potentially dangerous way, um, like now. Um, but before fighting external enemies, however, Louis had to deal with the internal ones, Building an army had a huge political social cost. And the one that was supposed to carry out uh, Louis' ambitious design was, as we've seen, in the worst possible shape. Um, 70,000 men only, which was embarrassingly few 
can't even control France with the the, the kind of the, the power that now is being unleashed on the battlefield with, with only 70,000 men, especially if they are essentially still the, the, the medieval or early modern way at that point, like undisciplined, poorly trained, subject to a corrupt and inefficient hierarchy, still hired with, as we will see now, very private corrupt means as ranks were not earned with commitment and valor but essentially they were both right um, and there were internal obstacles even in specific figures because as has had happened with Louis rise to power made possible by the death of Cardinal Mazzarino also in th this time it was the death of an er elderly court notable that paved the way for the Sun King the Duke of Epernon, Bernard de Nogaret de la Valette, in fact covered the role of colonel general of the infantry. This was a key position in the French administration at the time because all the management of the French armed forces depended on this figure, whose power, Louis in his memoirs himself stated, quote, was infinite superior to that of the king himself why right so aside from the duke of Epernon who held the, the position right um, the mechanism was quite uh, quite eloquent because among the various prerogatives of the colonel general the most important was the assignment of the commissions um, for for the officers uh, so a system was in use pretty much all over Europe by which the position of a colonel commander of a regiment was a real economic investment reserved for the wealthiest nobles who had to pay the highest bid um, buying the title from the colonel general becoming to all intents and purposes the, the owners Right, and then profiting from the expenses of the regimental maintenance, which were borne by the royal coffers in this regard. Um, and what was the problem? It, w of course, the fact that um, the the commissioners lucrated on it. The colonel general this w was the one who was bribed essentially to give the commissions. Uh, the nobility was the only element of of the French community that could afford this commissions um, naturally it was a lot of assigning of, of job assignments to friends etc but mostly turning a blind eye um, or just being embezzled well wh when uh, the regiments were paid for but then eventually uh, would be constantly kept under strength just to profit out of the commission that naturally was practically the pay that the uh, crown had provided these officers with that were not keeping the regiments at the highest um, standards because uh, to say the least to simply receive the money and not really invest in, it in, in the unit. This was a huge problem because it was the older um, one essentially emerging from the late Middle Ages as a form of uh, okay, I I create let's say if there is this mercenary company that can provide a for a military service as a state, I will just um, stabilize it. Um, I will make it permanent. We've seen it in the video about the Compagnie d'Ordonnance in the same France. It was one of the first countries to effectively established as permanent forces like that and then just um, I will pay for its uh, someone for its maintenance and so it will be but uh, this didn't entail any direct control from the side of the monarchy of the state on the quality of the troops because it was just up to the commanders that again could simply keep bribing um, and not being even pressured more than much politically to move and that's why the French army was such in, in 
poor shape because um, it could simply make leverage on the same crown not to be so demanding in this matters. So of course, the country had some broader political and strategic needs that were substantiated also for the nobility in uh, wars of expansion because um, there were still some uh, offices and rewards that would derive from the military service aside from these commissions. But at the same time, everything was very heterogeneous. There was not really a central control. And the, the monarchy had uh, been struggling to form a more efficient, permanent, and control system. So with the death of Lavalette, Louis took this power into his own hands, right? And uh, as a consequence, he immediately abolished the office of colonel general and began a profound restructuring of the French armed forces. Entrusting this task to a man who can be considered, like the king himself, one of the greatest military reformers of all time, François Michel Leterrier, Marquis de Louvois. Uh, Louvois uh, was, as you were saying before, part of this set of extraordinary men, um, provided with an incredible insight, mm, vision, rationale, practicality, um, and especially in this case, uh, also a great spirit of, um, say, initiative, but also of, of loyalty towards towards the king. Right, Lua was de facto the uh, the minister of war, right? Uh, namely, the French Secretary of State for War, right? And his military reforms literally made Louis uh, the Fourteenth Army that passed from 70,000 to 340,000 men. A huge increase. Naturally, this required an enormous secondary work, mostly in, in the civilian um, dimension, and we will talk about Colbert in the end, because you can't have any successful military reform without a, a massive um, uh, especially tax contribution and thus so administration and investments and money coming from somewhere right they can't be just squeezed from a system that uh, doesn't have mean of you know replenishing the resources as well so France was in parallel expanding in the colonies investing especially in mercantilism as Colbert chose that direction we will see um, and so everything was coordinated strictly between figures like, in fact, the same king, Louvois, Colbert, and I in a certain sense the same generals, because they were the ones who, at the end of the day, in this circle, knew uh, what, how many resources could be used, etc. For example, Vauban uh, was deeply interested also in, um, in tax systems in in rev he he studied a lot of juridical economical aspects because as you know he would build uh, he was the greatest military engineer in 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 history to to say the least um, he created a, a defensive belt of fortresses updated essentially as an improvement of the tras uh, italian this Vauban system in fact especially in the northeast of France, actually uh, all across the country, but with a specifically strategic purpose to coordinate them at the same time. It was calculated that of these hundreds of thousands of, of men that made up the French army at the time, 40% were garrisons, right? So there were troops like others, but of course had also this important kind of permanent function of just defending the country, because there was no time time of invasion just to put up a, a resistance simply with field armies and not uh, renouncing to the to the enormous strategic benefits that in fact this uh, this permanent force um, that now was taking probably a uniform national character as, uh, as we will see in a while pl uh, say installed on this extremely advanced the single most advanced and sophisticated 
classification system could afford. Right, remember again the French strategic needs. They had a huge land frontier, so uh, they couldn't do without fortresses, they couldn't do without also not just a few. F um, a few barriers because the, the, there is not a like a choke point at every meter right that you can't simply defend with a few troops you really have to defend the country with um, a cordon of 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 men by some the sound degree of course supported also by a mobile army that has also to essentially invade the other countries in, in the same way uh, etc in fact there is an enormous history of sieges that brought to the death of lots of people, including the the famed D'Artagnan. Um, and Louvois, however, is behind the the wall military structure. Really, the the figure who made the thing concretely. Um, he was competent, resolute, right? Knew what he was doing. So everything clearly true. He had the unreserved support of the king, uh, and he transformed a crumbling army into an efficient war machine. By the way, in a few years, right, we always make the point that most so-called military reformers in history didn't actually invent anything, right? When we talk about, I don't know, Marius or um, the same in the same modern era. Um, Nassau or 